So we're very um, pleased to have two really leading figures on the Canadian scene in terms of the digital economy. I should mention that we did invite a representative from Industry Canada, but no one was able to come to this event. So we, we have, as I mentioned, two very leading figures, and I think they'll be able to give us a good picture of the Canadian side of, of this, this area. Um, first, we have Namir Anani, who is president and CEO of the ICTC, which is the Information and Communications Technology Council. And this, is, this organization has been very important in terms of providing expertise and services in this whole field of the digital economy to a range of sectors, including industry, government, and education. And Mr. Anani is the chief strategist for this organization, and he also ha does have experience with the um, CRTC prior to this, where he led the policy development and research section at, the Cana at, at CRTC, which for those of you who don't know, is the Canadian Radio, Radio Television and Telecommunications Commission. So he really has been a driving force in this whole IT sector in Canada, and we're, we're looking forward to hearing from, from him. And we also have with us Anna Serrano, who works in a slightly different part of the, the digital economy. She's the director of the CFC Lab, and I, it's called, it's the Canadian Film Center Lab, so you can see she's dealing with a sort of different segment of the, of the, the digital media, really in the area of new media. Um, focusing on research, training, and production. Her organization is a, is a leading think tank in this arena, and she has a whole list of accomplishments in terms of really innovative approaches in terms of using digital media in this kind of wide range of new media services. So we'll start with, um, with Mr. Anani, and then we'll move to Ana Serrano. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invite. It's certainly my pleasure to be here today and to exchange on a subject of interest uh, to most of us or to all of us about the digital economy. Uh, but it's also the impact, obviously, on the larger uh, aspect, which is the innovation agenda. And I'd like to tackle it from the, you know, step back and look at it from a larger concept of the innovation e um, uh, economy because innovation is certainly the essence of any high performance economy and it's our ability to derive uh, economic and social wealth from ideas and concepts specifically in a global environment and while clearly technology is playing a bigger role in that because it's touching on all sectors of our economy in Canada from health to manufacturing to, to others the talent aspect is one that is particularly of focus to us, and I'd like to sort of uh, speak uh, to that. Uh, but let me address uh, a little bit more in terms of, you know, what are the various pillars that are, you know, of, of an innovation economy? Uh, and maybe through the discussion I will tackle as well is that we talked about productivity and innovation. So whose role is it, and how do we, you know, advance that in, in, in Canada? And certainly there is the notion of the job inclusion, uh, you know, for the unemployed, underemployed, and the talent supply, the skills shortage. But I'd like to focus also on a specific domain which is closer to really where we'd like to drive as an organization is how do we tackle the skills gap leveraging the youth. The youth are digital natives in, in Canada. They know exactly how the technology works, but we're still at 142 unemployment level, which is double that of the, the national average. We're not 50% like Spain. However, there is a lot to be done in that, in that environment, and I'll talk to, to, to this. Uh, a little bit about my organization, just to know where we, we, you know, what aspects that we do and how does that relate to some of the discussions that we're doing. We're a national center of expertise. We provide end-to-end -end solutions from technology, economic, and labor market uh, research right to talent solutions. We actually have programs in schools, in high schools across the country, over 200 now that we started over two years, where we provide grade 11 and 12, not only with technology, business skills, and others, and the continuum with colleges and universities. But also we provide policies from economic to uh, immigration to um, uh, talent. Let me tackle the, the main pillars of um, uh, the innovation economy as we see it. I think we talked about it uh, 
uh, initially. And I'll keep my presentation to 15 minutes, so allow for more debate and discussion on this. Clearly, trade policies is, is one that is uh, very important because it's our ability to establish trade partners um, and develop that, that agenda uh, of innovation because it's all about the exchange of technology and concepts. So while, uh, you know, uh, trading and, and, and Canada has been sort of active in that arena, uh, we need more of that, specifically with the emerging markets, and I'll expand on this uh, aspect. I think what's happening at the moment is that, and it's, it's been tackled here, is that while we have, I mean, for instance, if you look at our, um, Europe is actually our second trading partner. Uh, I know we represent to Europe your 12th trading partner from your perspective. However, um, you know, Europe is an important dimension for us and our ability to expand and specifically for our industries to expand in developing trading partners will help create the synergy of, of innovation uh, going forward. And clearly the Canada Comprehensive Trade Agreement that's being discussed at the moment is gonna go a long way to develop that um, going forward. But it's, it is clear that you know, uh, at the heart of it, and it's fair to say that a lot of the large industries, just look at the communications industries, really focused on the Canadian market and potentially lesser on the international market. And there is a dimension there to be done in developing those partners, uh, partnerships uh, going forward. I'll focus a little bit more on the digital skills, the talent, and, and so forth, because I think it's important to, to look at it from two dimensions. If you want to stimulate the innovation economy, you have to have the right skills uh, to be able to entice innovation, but also the productivity factor within the industry. But there's no point developing all that economy, uh, whether it's uh, you know, mobile and the mobile banking or mobile health or others, if we as citizens and consumers are not able to reap the benefit of that. So hence, there is a essential digital skills that have to develop in a country. And in fact, there is a lot of discussion at the moment, and the OECD is producing a report called, you know, on PIAC in terms of what are the essential skills, and Canada has participated heavily in that, in that uh, report. I think it will be published, the report, in the next couple of days uh, on this. But we know for a fact that, uh, you know, by 2015, there will be approximately 90 and 90 percent of the jobs will require some uh, level of digital skills and it's important that we have that concept in mind as part of the the gap the skills and labor gap that we see i mean we estimated in the last um, last year and a half uh, through some of the research that we've done that by 2016 in canada will will require approximately 106,000 critical jobs in ict to be filled and in fact, when the report was published, I was very conservative in sending that, that message out because that was specific to the ICT sector. But if I take the impact of ICTs, the prevalent impact on all sectors of the economy, whether it's the banking, the manufacturing, and the health, as I mentioned, and others, oil and gas, then it would be multifold that, or, you know, uh, that, uh, that figure in terms of the critical jobs that we, we require. And I'll talk about that shortly. That coupled with an environment that ICT is around the jobless rate, in fact, the latest figure that we have is 3.4, but if you look at, on average, it's about 2.5%. So it's very minimum, and the demand is outweighing the supply. And if we're not able to meet that demand, it's going to be a difficult sort of environment going forward in trying to stimulate that economy uh, in the future. And certainly, as others talked about it, we've done uh, sufficient research in the, in the emerging or enabling technologies of the future, and whether it's the cloud, the apps, mobile, they are not industries that are growing between 4 and 5 percent. They're growing between 25 and 42 percent per year. So you can imagine the exponential growth that is happening in that arena and the talent needs that we're going to require in the next number of years. Thank you. A little bit about some of the enabling technologies that I, I mentioned. Um, I think the mobile ecosystem, we all agree on that. And I call it the mobile, mobile ecosystem because it's not about just the mobile devices. It's about the cloud. It's about the apps. The combination of all of those are driving not only cost 
uh, efficiencies in the industry. I think we, we hear a lot about the cloud providing cost efficiencies. But when I talk to the industry, it is about also how do you innovate in that environment. If the banking sector doesn't know how to use the mobile technology in terms of increasing transactions, and if I buy from Canadian Tire and Starbucks using my mobile device, how can they upsell me using the cloud capability of new services, then how can they innovate in that, in that arena? Uh, the same with the health sector, if you look at it, apart from the efficiencies, but you know, most of the information currently is available in, in different servers across the, the country. So how you're able, without using the cloud, how you're able to leverage the, the potential of the cloud to do aggregated research, to try to understand the impact of medication on the larger population or immunization on the larger population, all of that is going to be important to reflect on, on how do you innovate in that, in that arena. Automation robotics is one arena that's really expanding and happy to provide more research on that uh, in the future. Um, and certainly it's, a, it's an arena of growth. You've seen some of the markets, whether it's Japan or China and now India, growing by 12 to 15 percent per year uh, because of the adoption of technology in that. And there is clearly a lot of offshoring happening from different countries to, to move into that arena because of that, you know, move, move in these emerging markets because of the, their capabilities in that. Informatics and social media from all the technologies of the social media, but also health informatics and others is going to be huge. But all to say that there are the jobs of the future that are going to be very important. So what are the employable competencies that we have to de develop in the country to make sure that we have the capabilities to, to meet the demand of the digital, but more importantly, the innovation economy. And I mentioned you know, at a high level that the 106,000 critical jobs that I talked about was specific to the ICT sector. If you look at the demand in the next number of years, there will be 33,000 jobs that will be required by 2018 in the cloud, 40,000 in, in the mobile economy, uh, whether it's mobile banking, mobile health, and others. Um, even in the manufacturing, uh, even in the manufacturing and the machine-to-machine -machine technologies, that it's uh, becoming very pervasive in everything we do. Seventy-eight thousand that will be created in the apps economy. We did a research a year ago. It was an eye-opener to me, having worked with the communications industry, and I, I presume that you know a lot of the larger industries really dominate the, 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 the you know the marketing in Canada. But uh, to be honest, it's a really there. There is a. You know, 80% approximately of the Canadian industry is less than 10 employees. So the SMEs are the biggest thrust and the dynamo or the, you know, engine for, for growth in, in Canada. And we have to really focus on that. I talked about that, and I'll skip through some of the, the presentations. So I talked about, you know, trade as an important element. Uh, I talked about the competencies and the development of that because that's really the skills of the future that we have to develop, or what I call them, the employable skills of the future, not concentrating on what is being, what the job market is looking today, but what do we have to forecast in the next three to five years to develop that. And I'll maybe add a dimension to this. While we, we're good um, in, in the education continuum, but this fast-paced environment is going to have to get us to reflect differently. Um, universities have a maybe a, lead, a longer lead time than the colleges because the advancement of these technology require retraining, reskilling all the time. I think the concept of coming out with a, an education and maintaining that education for the rest of the career is not a reality. That and this environment is changing, uh, you know, in leaps and bounds, and we have to reflect how do we bridge that gap with four months, six months retraining every six, four, five, six years and, and that. Research and development is a very important dimension. And while there are certain incentives from the government to you know, industrial research assistance program and the new uh, DTAP that was uh, introduced, uh, I think more has to be done. And I would put the emphasis now is that uh, while the in larger industries in Canada uh, you know, potentially folk have some focus in Canada and the rest is internationally because of the global environment that we're in. 
it's important for the industry also to partake into that and to help that uh, you know uh, entice research direct research from the small medium enterprise to be built uh, as well The fifth element that I see in the innovation economy is obviously no industry can start or grow without funding. Um, and certainly there are many mechanisms out there for to acquire funding. Uh, but I think it's important again, and I really refocus it back to the larger enterprises, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll look at the debate that's happening with Europe. I think it's very important for them to resource from small medium enterprises because that's how we're going to entice growth, but also innovation to take place in, in the country. And I think corporate taxation is an important dimension. Just look at the gaming industry, how we became third in the world uh, in, um, uh, and with a, with a hub, with a center in Montre Montreal as a result of introducing basically concepts of uh, the supply of talent through you know, the programming uh, in, in terms of the schools, the CEGEP and, 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 and the colleges and others, but also introducing some corporate tax taxation to help that environment prosper. And I think if we have to focus, we have to focus our corporate taxation on where the growth areas with the highest potential for job creation uh, and contribution to GDP. Um, when I talk about that, so th these are the sectors that are highlighted initially, the, the app, the, the automation robotics, these are growing fast. So whether it's to entice education that dimension or lower corporate taxation for the industry to grow, it's going to be important for us. In terms of productivity, uh, if I can touch on that, uh, you know, it's a little bit away from the access to capital uh, discussion, but I think it's important to mention. You know, when I talked about all e these emerging sectors and emerging economies, uh, it's interesting that, um, you know, even just the mobile arena and the usage of adoption by, by, by the industry currently, um, you know, we're looking at a 3% uh, productivity measure as a result of that will, will, will result in approximately $27 billion to the economy. This is huge in Canada to be done. So we really need more of those adoptions of, of technology uh, going forward. Thank you. Let me talk quickly. I've got two slides uh, to conclude with. So, you know, as I talked about the productivity innovation agenda and where technology plays a part, we are strong believers in my organization, and we're pushing that, that agenda as well, that it's no longer up to just uh, the ICT practitioners in the industry or the CIOs and their, their, you know, their environment to move the innovation agenda within the industry. It's about the business leaders having strong concepts in technology to be able to partake in the discourse of innovation. Uh, top executives from the banking sector, if they're not able to understand what's the use of the cloud in upselling, or somebody, a physician from the, the health sector is not able to understand how can they leverage the cloud to do aggregated research and better understanding of the impact on the population, may not be able to partake in that, in that discourse. And in fact, that's part of the discussions that we have. And as I mentioned, while there is a dimension of upskilling within the industry, we as citizens and, you know, and uh, consumers um, also have to have the right technology, the right understanding of the technology to be able to reap the benefit of this, of this economy. I'll conclude with this slide, which is the inclusion and, and youth. There's many dimensions to it. I mean, in Canada, in fact, with the jobless rate being at 2.5 to 3.4, youth unemployment is still high. It's, 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 uh, you know, it's still staggering at 14.2%. Uh, we should and we could leverage more of the human capital in Canada, whether it's Aboriginal youth. In fact, women, young women in ICT, is, our figures are much le less than any other country. I mean, we, our representation in this field is approximately 25%, uh, and we're working in that domain at the moment uh, to try to sort of advance that agenda in Canada compared to some other countries that, you know, participation of women in, in the field are around 42% uh, in, that, in that arena. Career bridging becomes important because it's not about just the educational dimension. Uh, we need to provide face value, face time of the graduates to the industry because that's how you're going to secure them jobs and get them into 
into the industry. And whether they continue as in their, you know, with the industry in, 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 in their careers, or they move out of the industry and create their own companies, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're nurturing the entrepreneurship in, in Canada, and that's what we should be doing. So I'll conclude with that, and thank you very much. Um, I'm Anna Serrano, and uh, I'm really going to approach this discussion from a completely different angle, which is to look at uh, the sort of the digital economy from the small lens of entertainment, okay? So the digital entertainment economy, if you will. Now, you could argue, well, why are we actually talking about entertainment? And, um, you know, we know that we like to play games. We know that we like to perhaps illegally stream videos online. And we know we like to, uh, you know, <laughs> someone's laughing there. I can see who's, who's streaming. Don't worry. I'm one of those people, perhaps. Um, we know that we are, we're playing with our apps, but what does it really mean from an economic perspective? Well, um, you know, in terms of uh, in terms of the entertainment cluster, Ontario um, is the third largest uh, film production location in North America, um, behind California and New York. Um, and in 2011 alone, um, Ontario had a, an incredible year in terms of production volume of film and TV projects. And the, the, it climbed to a record of 1.26 billion, which was an increase of 30% um, since 2010. Um, and it's also employing about 300,000 Ontarios a year in the sector in 2011. Now that's just for film and TV. Once you start actually building in the rest of the uh, entertainment cluster, those number, uh, the, the rest of the ICT entertainment cluster, those numbers start to really um, um, go move up. And uh, so the, in terms of the economy, um, Ontario is specifically the Ministry of Culture and certainly the industry development in, in, in um, if the federal government are quite bullish about looking at the growth rates in the entertainment sector as it relates to um, job growth and productivity growth um, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, numbers when it starts to move into the digital economy space. So the film center really has been well positioned as the preeminent institution in film, television, and digital media to sort of take on the leadership role of figuring out how we can really support the growth of the digital entertainment sector in this country. Um, in terms of the film center itself, um, I think uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the Film Center um, was started by Norman Jewison 25 years ago. Um, it was started in Ontario, in Toronto, um, as a means to commercialize the feature film production of this country. So at that time, our feature films were mainly um, auteur-driven uh, pro uh, products or properties, and uh, with Norman Jewison being a commercial film director and, and largely working in Hollywood, he felt that it was important to start a, a really robust, um, commercially driven, uh, and or obviously artistically driven um, feature film community. And so he started the Film Center to, to create that um, sort of uh, best in breed class of talent that would make films that make money. And so for the past 25 years, his dream of developing a robust feature film industry um, has been met uh, you know, a thousand fold. And since then, over the years, we've added television production as part of the roster of, of talent that we support. We've added um, digital media. Um, we've added uh, music co composers in the feature film industry, and we've added actors and documentary filmmakers. Um, and to date, essentially, our alumni um, are the ones who are either driving um, large uh, economic growth in this country by the creation of large-scale production companies like Shaftesbury, or by the creation of high-end, um, over-the-line talent who are driving um, new projects like Orphan Black, 
I don't know if any of you, of you guys have heard of that, um, Rookie Blue, CSI, et cetera. Um, and so we've done very, very well. And, and, then, and, and that's in film and television. And in the digital media space, um, we've also had alumni who are the ones that have created you know, large scale digital agencies like Trapeze, Secret Location, et cetera, who are not only creating jobs, but creating um, productions that, inc that, um, that essentially hire out large numbers of contractors um, who are working on these projects. So in the entertainment industry, the SMEs that um, you alluded to indeed may have you know, five to 10 um, employees, but once a production takes place, each production could then hire up to you know, 50 to 300 people depending on the size of the production. So it, it contracts and um, expands. Um, so, you know, so we've had a really good run at this stuff, and in terms of our economic impacts, for example, um, in terms of our productivity, um, you know, the CFC graduates, um, they, on our, in terms of their reported annual earnings, they actually uh, earn up to $17,000 more than anyone else who've gone through any other program. Um, in terms of the average duration of weeks worked per year, because it's a it's a fairly um, it's it, we're talking about both SME type uh, grad alumni as well as the freelancers, right? So in terms of the duration of weeks worked, 32% um, of them uh, there's a, an increase of 32% of weeks worked for CFC film projects, 79% on TV projects, and 263% increase of weeks worked for those working on digital media projects. Um, and then uh, in terms of green lighting rates, so if you're, a, if you're in the entertainment sector and you have projects that you want made in film or TV, if you come through the film center, um, your uh, green lighting rate is 158% likely that your project will be greenlit, and in TV it's 132%. Um, and then participation in projects for development, in film it's 152% likely that other partners will participate in your project. In TV, it's 400%, and in digital media, it's 81%. So these numbers are pretty high. Um, we obviously uh, have been working very hard on really uh, crafting um, an institution that supports the best of breed talent. And so now, as we move forward into really solidifying um, and, and uh, taking advantage of the opportunities in the digital economy, how are we going to do that? What are our plans, and how do we how do we plan to do better? So um, before I get to that, let me just backtrack a little bit. So um, uh, currently, I'm now uh, the chief digital officer of the Canadian Film Centre. So this is part of my task, which is to sort out. Uh, the opportunities of the digital economy as it relates to the entertainment industry and specifically as it relates to our talent that we bring into the film center as well as our partners and our partners include everything from all the major broadcasters to telco players to the government etc um, but prior to being in this position um, I actually was, uh, I founded the CFC Media Lab in 1997. So I've been working in the ICT and entertainment space um, since 1993. I worked with Don Tapscott's um, uh, first consulting company called Alliance for Converging Technologies in 93 and 94, where we actually did the first syndicated study on the effect of networked interactive multimedia on 10 different industry sectors. So at that time, we called it NIM, can you believe it? <laughs> so that's how we termed new media in 93. And uh, that was prior to the commercial web being born. So, you know, Mozilla was not, I mean, uh, Netscape was not around in 93, it came out in 94. So, um, so I've been in this space for a long time. And in 97, uh, I was asked by Norman Jewison to see whether I could head up uh, and, and excuse me, develop this media lab at the film center. And, um, and, you know, the, the, the reality is that kind of um, prescient um, vision that Norman and Wayne had at that time, uh, you couldn't have really expected, uh, uh, you couldn't really have uh, understood un unless uh, you are seeing it from today. Because in 97, in effect, they were, you know, they put, they bet on the idea that, okay, let's think of doing a media lab that's focused on storytelling and figure out 
what those new kinds of products and services in the entertainment sector might be that are using network digital technologies. Um, but in 97, at that time, there was no video on the web, there was no social media, there were no mobile phones that were consumer-based, let alone smartphones. I mean, there were, but if you watch Wall Street, you know, um, Gordon Gecko had a phone that was that big, right? Um, there were, uh, you know, there was no flash on the web, um, and uh, broadband was just starting. And at best, you know, we were really looking at maybe you know, products that would go into the interactive television trials in London and Repontigny at that time. So, so both Norman Jewison and Wayne Clarkson, our executive directors at that time, actually said, okay, okay, fine, you can start up this media lab, but we don't actually know what that's going to be. So, um, and, and that and that kind of skunk works mentality, or that, uh, that notion that um, they would keep financing a media lab that was really experimenting and researching and trying to figure out how to tell, how to create entertainment products and services um, on digital uh, networked technologies. I'm, if you notice, I'm not saying the web because it wasn't necessarily clear that it was just the web at the time. Um, that, that, uh, that particular point of view lasted for 15 years. <laughs> so for 15 to, you know, for maybe for 12 to 15 years, we were the ugly cousin of the, of the film and television departments of the Canadian Film Centre, um, who kept getting, you know, an allowance, even though no one understood why we <laughs> were being given an allowance. And uh, in fact, that actually worked out really, really well because um, it allowed us to produce over 300 different interactive media prototypes, um, finance and commercialize major complex large-scale productions that the private sector wouldn't touch, including the Great Canadian Story Engine that we launched in 2000, um, which was the first user-generated content site in Canada that was supported by the CBC um, using just Flash. So this was uh, a place where Canadians could tell stories about what it means to be a Canadian in 2000. Today, you, th you talk about that and you go, you did, you know, what's the point? Well, what was that about? Because everyone could, there were no blogs then. So if you can imagine, you know, in 2000, that was a pretty big, uh, that was a pretty big issue. Um, and then we also produced a large scale interactive um, feature film um, that the private sector couldn't really figure out um, in, in uh, 2006 that was not only featured at the Toronto International Film Festival, but also picked up for commercial distribution. So we've been able to experiment. And as a result of that, of that continuous experimentation with the, an eye towards commercialization. So we weren't just an R&D facility that, that l tried to figure out interactive storytelling, but we were also looking at it from a commercial perspective. We were able to, to build the capacity of a number of creative talent who understood digital networked media, but who also understood how to make a living out of it. But what's interesting is if you fast forward to today in you know, 2012, 2013, it took about 12 to 13 years to sort out the core um, uh, aesthetic, um, sort of uh, 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 creative issues, if you will, with some of the business stuff. But it really hasn't been until the past four to five years that, the, that, that, the, that, that some of the business models around um, digital media entertainment have started to solidify. So as a result of this, our next uh, 25 years moving forward is really about product commercialization and company sustainability. So our focus now has moved away from, obviously we're still doing talent capacity building, but now our focus really is on supporting those SMEs um, that are in the space and providing them with the appropriate um, business mentoring um, and resource networks to commercialize those products. And part of that whole process requires um, a global outlook. 
So most of our uh, initiatives, which I, ca I call acceleration initiatives, two more minutes, acceleration initiatives are really um, partnered focused. Our core accelerator program is called Idea Boost, and we have a, a website called ideaboost.ca. That particular digital entertainment accelerator um, has founding partners of Google, uh, Chorus Entertainment and Shaw Media, and we have partnerships with VCs in Silicon Valley. We have partnerships with um, uh, uh, other broadcasters outside of Canada, uh, um, and in fact, um, some of the things that we we're, we're talking about are co-production type initiatives with place with people in France, for example. Um, so, uh, so we're really focused on this notion of uh, uh, understanding that the global market is the core market for many of these SMEs that we're accelerating, um, and that's really the only. Uh, uh, sort of way we can we can uh, provide sustainability, but the second piece around the sustainability issue also has to do with the fact that the type of business acceleration we're doing is predicated on finding customers for your products and services, as opposed to only finding financing. And I think that's something that also the European, you know, Europe and Canada need to sort out as well: is how to encourage. Um, productivity and growth of companies in this space, and in my case in the digital entertainment space, um, by ensuring that the products are things that, that customers actually want to buy and not just um, uh, finding ways in which we could provide financing for them through government. So I think I'll leave it at that because we're running out of time and we can, um, we can answer your questions. Thanks.